Today's guest is Keith Helmuth. He has an idea. It's called the Bank of New Brunswick. With an election coming in 2018, the topic of deficits and debts for governments is going to dominate the conversation. People never seem to get to what the solution is. Keith Helmuth, the idea of a bank in New Brunswick, is a potential solution. Here's Keith. So thanks for coming. Thank you. <laughs> it's really good to be here. <laughs> good start. <laughs> so we're here to talk about a notion or an idea called the Bank of New Brunswick and the notion of public banking. Um, it's going to be a steep learning curve for some people in the audience, but your lecture gently walks people through. So how do you start people with this whole idea that we can be a, a bit more autonomous with our finances? Well, it really starts, uh, I think, because of the debt and deficit problem, which uh, seems to be a perpetual situation without any really good solutions for how the government of New Brunswick um, gets out of debt, for first of all, which is a really big issue. Uh, it's quite possible to reduce the deficit through various means, but the, the debt problem itself is recurring and perpetual. And, and everything I've read, all the suggestions I've, I've seen about uh, the limitations of raising taxes to increase government re revenue, uh, increasing fees on government services, uh, streamlining the efficiencies of government and reducing costs, or having economic growth in the province to the extent that the tax revenue would then help to overcome the, the debt and deficit problem. None of those seem to really be adequate to the scale of the problem that not only New Brunswick, but many governments face in handling their continual deficit financing and their growing debt on which they pay interest at increasingly high rates. So so is part of all of that a perception problem? Is part of why the issue repeats itself decade after decade? Because we keep looking at it the wrong way? Um, there's num a number of ways you can look at it. <laughs> Uh, and part of it has to do with the whole structure and design of the monetary system and the banking system, which goes back to the 17th century. Yes. <laughs> it has a long history. And uh, the way the, uh, the Bank of England was originally formulated to enable the king to borrow money to pursue the wars that were going on because he was running out of funds, uh, and a very ingenious structure called fractional reserve uh, lending was developed first with the goldsmiths and then the Bank of England that enabled money to be created. Um, uh, and that has gone on and become the, become the design feature of the banking industry as it developed and as it now operates in modern times. And it's in the hands of the private in, uh, for-profit for banking industry in most cases, uh, rather than in the hands of a non-profit uh, public trust, government, chartered agency. So that's it's, a key point right there, a philosophical or operational difference based on a philosophy of the private for-profit mindset model and right. the public not-for-profit model. Right, that's, that's correct. Um, and this is something that a lot of people have understood over the years, but the pressures for continuing uh, the monetary system, its management, and particularly the, the creation of um, debt in order to increase the money supply has been in the hands primarily of the private banking industry because it's an enormous profit center. I mean, in terms of the, the logic of it, it makes a lot of sense. Well, you can charge uh, interest on something that's not there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but for, but for example, uh, one of the quotes I used in my lecture from Mackenzie King who was a Canadian Prime Minister from 1935 to 1948, he understood this problem very well, and I'll read his quote. He says, Once a nation parts with the control of its currency and credit, it matters not who makes the nation's laws. Until the control of the issue of currency and credit is restored to the government and recognized as its most sacred responsibility, all talk of sovereignty, of parliament, and of democracy is idle and futile. And the really interesting example of this is that in the uh, mid-30s, the Bank of Canada was actually made into a public bank. 
And from, from that time until 1974, the Bank of Canada was able to borrow at very low interest rates, in some cases no, no interest, from its own bank, uh, which enabled it to, to come out of the Depression, finance the Second World War, their participation in the Second World War, to finance major uh, projects after the Second World War, the recovery, uh, universities, hospitals, uh, the St. Lawrence Seaway, a good deal of the Trans Canada, were all financed through uh, the government going to its own bank, low interest rates, and in some cases no in interest rates, and borrowing the money needed to do that, that um, progressive recovery and economic development. Then in 1974, the decision was made, the Liberal government made a decision under the under the framework of uh, neoliberal economic policy and globalization to become part of the Bank of International Settlements, the Swiss private bank that has a huge structure of coordinating international finance. And when that happened, they stopped using the Bank of Canada for financing government projects, and they began to borrow entirely from the private financial industry and then things began to accumulate in terms of debt and deficit ever since. Well, shortly after that, I believe in the mid-70s, there were wage and price controls. In, in an effort to control inflation, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, okay. that was true. So, I interesting points. Oh, there, because, <clears throat> so we had autonomy to a certain point in time, and what you just mapped out in terms of how we got out of, you know, the recession, World War II, financing World War II, there's similarities, at least in some of the language, with today, with spending money on infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a risk element to privatizing all of that public infrastructure through how it's being financed. So do you find an echo? Well, what, there's sort of two different levels. We started talking about the New Brunswick situation, and then I shifted to the federal situation because they're, they're similar in terms of the relationship to borrowing money from the, from the financial industry. Uh, and then f to make up for the lack of the revenue coming from the tax, the tax s side. Um, the ideal situation would be for the Bank of Canada to be restored to its original purpose, and then that could facilitate for the provinces the same type of low-cost borrowing from a, a public bank. In lieu of that, <laughs> One of the options would be for the provinces, and New Brunswick in this case, to actually establish its own provincial bank, its own public bank, and be able to borrow for its own purposes within the structure of, of its own uh, financial administration, financial management. The way I like to think about it is that a public bank would be like a credit union for the government. Uh, a credit union is owned by its members. The sole purpose of the credit union is to pro provide financial services at l low cost to its members. The government, a public bank, would, would be owned by the government in the same way that a credit union is owned by its m members, and it would be a nonprofit, profit uh, chartered as a nonprofit financial institution. Its sole purpose would be to help finance the government and do the things that the government needs to do for the benefit of the common good of the citizens. So the profit motive would be taken out and the the interest that would be gained would be recycled through back to the, to the government and none of it would be paid out yeah. to the uh, bondholders that are somewhere else in the world yeah <laughs> the money that would be that would be needed would be circulating within the province rather than being siphoned off and that's sort of the key the key, key difference so a quick question surfaces on that do we have the authority to do that um, yeah, I don't think there's any problem about that happening. It would be it would be political will. It would be the understanding that this would be a wise thing to do from the standpoint of uh, provincial financial management, fiscal responsibility, and it would need to then uh, find a way to to capitalize that bank to get going. So first of all, all government revenues would go through that bank, and all expenditures would go through that bank. So everything would be would be within that one frame, f framework. Um, the details of how that would be chartered and incorporated would have to be legislation, but there's nothing to prevent a, the province from actually establishing their own bank. I say, <laughs> I say nothing to prevent them, except an awful lot of pressure from sources that would not want that to happen, mm -hmm. because 
that means the province would then be able to manage their finances within their own structure, yeah. and they would no longer be be paying a, uh, a perpetual rate of interest to outside organizations who are very interested in seeing that continue. It's yeah. a very, yeah. lucr very well, lucrative thing. Thank you for that. Because one of the narratives that constantly runs through New Brunswick when talking about government, politics, and economics is that why can't the government get itself out of debt? But those same people in deficits, mm -hmm. and those same people don't seem to do the levels of homework needed to understand where that debt comes from in the first place and how that debt is sustained in the first place. And if you want the government to get out of debt, then what you're providing is part of the answer for how that happens. But there's a resistance to make the shift into that autonomy. So how ironic that, you know, in 28, 29, 2008, 2009, I think it was around then, that Self-Sufficiency New Brunswick Task Force was created. Mm -hmm. And not mm -hmm. once did they talk about changing the banking system yeah. to give us control yeah. over our own resources and step out of that, that paradigm yeah. or that perception that this is the way it's done. Yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a general sense that the that the monetary system, the ba the banking system, is sort of like a uh, a natural a natural law <laughs> that you can't tamper with. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that that the way it operates now is in fact something that that uh, we simply have to put up with, and we have to manage, uh, and increasingly um, put in programs of austerity to cut government expenses and struggle with the with the whole administration of what the government is supposed to be doing in relation to the revenue that it actually has. Yeah. But um, the, the, uh, it's, it's called mystification. Like, like you just don't th even think about, about that because it's not something that can be changed. Well, that's just not right. Yeah. I mean, we know that it doesn't have to operate that, like that way because Canada has a long history of having a public bank that operated very, very well yeah. uh, to finance all kinds of things for the public good. Yeah. And that could happen again. In, in fact, the, there's an organization uh, in Canada called uh, Committee for Monetary and Economic Re Reform, COMER, and they've been going for decades, uh, and this is one of their chief um, points in their program, is that the Bank of Canada is actually legally required to operate in this public bank framework, and it should be restored to that public bank framework. If that were to happen, then it would have a ripple effect throughout the the whole country. Within all the provinces, could be part of that framework. Um, they've been at this a long time. They haven't succeeded in convincing any government that they should move in that direction. Hmm. Uh, the relationships with the the Bank of International Settlements and the whole globalized financial network is such that it's it would it it would take a groundswell. <laughs> of, yes. Of public opinion to give a government a mandate to make this change yeah. that's possible it's, it's quite it's quite possible but meanwhile it would be also possible for the government of New Brunswick to think about solving this problem within the framework of their own their own scale some of what you um, map out also sounds familiar with uh, I think it was the 2008-2009 election. I'm not sure if I got the right times. So it's when Sean Graham came into power the first time mm -hmm. um, on promises of delivering a public auto insurance system. Oh, Because okay. the previous okay. government had done the task mm -hmm. force and, and it was all done. Like all the work was done. All three parties had yeah. bought in. Uh, Manitoba would kind of partner us mm -hmm. into their system. Mm -hmm. um, there had been lots of public discussion. And the election happened, the Liberals win, and no, we can't do this. So that's an interesting, that, that's interesting spot stuff. where it gets stuck because yeah. it, some research has shown it would create so many jobs in the province and mm -hmm. it would keep the profits in the province. Yeah. So that co-op mindset or that member-owner mindset yeah. and, and another conversation surfaced two or three years later on monetization of MB Liquor. Mm-hmm of ways of keeping MB Liquor within the province, um, mm -hmm. owned by the people of the province, mm -hmm. but monetizing it so they could have some resources for expansion or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So something gets stuck from three different conversations. That's interesting, yeah. That, that it doesn't seem to want to shift over into the new paradigm or the new model, or old model brought new. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, the Maritimes has a long history of the development of cooperatives 
cooperatives and credit unions. Uh, a, a lot of it started here and then spread across Canada and, and elsewhere. Um, and this this is an example. Uh, I hadn't thought about the insurance the insurance industry and these other ex examples, but they are they are small examples of the same type of shift in thinking about how to provide uh, a a public service within a nonprofit framework uh, that would that would be beneficial for the common good for the public interest. Um, there is the argument, and you hear it all the time, that well, government's so inefficient that you can't it can't be trusted to do these things. They'll just waste a lot of money, and and it'd be better to let private industry, private businesses operate these various public services, uh, or some some combination of public private. It's often talked about too. Um, in the case of the monetary system, that's particularly sensitive because people will say that well, if you let the government create the money it needs, uh, it will just it will just create too much, there'll be huge inflation. That used to be that used to be a reasonable argument, but it's no longer the case because the way um, the way the digital world can monitor information and and keep track and manage uh, things now is very, very different than it used to be. So the idea I think would really be for for the public bank to be a public trust agency, it wouldn't actually be, it, w it, it would be an agency that would serve the government, but it wouldn't actually be the government making the decisions about how that was structured and run. Mm -hmm. The government would rely on it to do its financing uh, and, and management of its, of, its, uh, of its fiscal responsibilities, mm -hmm. but it would, be, it would be in a framework that would be commissioned to operate uh, sort of at arm's length, sort of like a royal commission, or not a royal commission, but a, but a uh, crown corporation. A crown corporation, yeah. So there would be a separation between between the political aspect of government and the administration of the financial aspect of government. And back to the perception shift thought, and thank you for this, mm -hmm. it's wonderful. Um, it reminds me of a video clip you can find on YouTube called uh, The Five Monkeys. It's an experiment, mm. a social experiment that was done to abridge it. So if you want to find it, just go YouTube, <laughs> find you know the five monkeys, and you'll see it. Uh, but the short of it is, at some point at the end of the experiment, five monkeys in a cage, a banana hanging mm. from the ceiling, a ladder. Monkey goes to get the banana. The other monkeys are watching, and they, the other monkeys get sprayed with a hose. And the correlation or the connection is made causal behavior mm -hmm. shifts mm -hmm. um, that every time a monkey goes to get the banana the other ones get hosed they quickly start pulling that monkey down because they don't want to get hosed <laughs> okay. okay yeah now over time they replace all five of the monkeys mm -hmm. at some point all five monkeys stop anybody from getting the banana uh, but they've stopped hosing them but they still continue the behavior and they still continue the behavior conditioning yes yeah right yeah so, so it's an, a neat little and it's a true experiment but mm -hmm. it's an example of getting across a complex idea in a simple way, mm -hmm. but why we're so stuck with change. Mm -hmm. And banking becomes one of the key pieces because it's so central and money is supposed to flow. Yeah. Not yeah. stay stuck in places like offshore accounts and, and that kind of thing. So you're mapping up for us. There's a place where New Brunswick can dislodge itself from an old pattern of behavior mm -hmm. and actually getting on with self-directing its own outcome, which is exactly how you would want to raise your child, <laughs> to, to say, here, you're on your own, you can run now. Right. Um, the, an, another general framework for understanding um, sort of the, the historical and social dynamic uh, that goes along with the development of the monetary system is to think about it in terms of the development of democracy um, as, as our Western civilization has moved along, we've had various progressive stages of democratic development. Uh, for, for, for example, uh, it used to be that only the, the elite wealthy had education or medical services. Now we have this concept of these goods, these common goods being available to citizens uh, as a function of, uh, of the government responsibilities. Uh, the monetary system could be looked at in the same the same way, but it hasn't made that step yet into the idea of it being a 
common good, a common social good. People think about money as a private possession, mm -hmm. but really it's a it's a social a social trust institution. Uh, it used to be that money was based in commodities. I mean, you know, there was the gold, there was the silver, all those things. That's long, long gone. Money is now an agreement of social trust, and it's managed and it's created and it's it's used in ways that that can be designed to um, benefit people in a democratic way. The problem with money is it's still stuck in kind of that old system, where the the private financial institutions have maintained the, the um, well, what actually happened is government sort of turned over, and this, this goes back, this goes back to say, w one really good, good example is after the American Revolution, uh, Alexander Hamilton argued with George Washington and with the Congress that the financial system of the United States should be put in the hands of the New York bankers because they know how to do it. Uh, and he argued with Jefferson and others, and Hamilton won. And ever since that time, uh, the, the, the ability to create money for the government has been, has been contracted out to the private financial industry. That's still true. That's a design feature. It, it was something that was thought out. Uh, it had some arguments in its favor, but it's continued to be a way that government never gets out of debt. Yeah. Well, there's a great movie called Zitgeist. It's been on YouTube for a long time, and it maps out the impact of the Federal Reserve, its founding, mm -hmm. yeah. and its structure, okay. yeah. and, and how um, the whole business of lending money you really don't have and charging interest on money you don't have to governments yeah. so they can go. Yeah. So when people current day, like Atlantic Institute on Market Studies and some of the others that mm -hmm. take the pot shots from the sideline mm -hmm. at a government going through an election period, and you're going to get it next year, yeah, yeah. you know, saying, yeah. why can't this government get itself out of debt? Well, we're, all, we're go, already getting it. <laughs> yeah. Go, go do your homework. Yeah. Go find it. Because the structure yeah. was rigged from the get-go on, yeah. on that model. Yeah. But there are other models to get us out of debt. And I wanted to make that connection that here's an example. You mm -hmm. have an example of... Well, if that's what you truly want, mm -hmm. then this is how you do it. Yeah, and and the fact that this can be documented uh, uh, historically and currently is really important. And the example that always comes up is the state of North Dakota. Uh, in in 1909, the state of North Dakota was in sort of terrible financial depression situ situation, and uh, the political climate was such that the government established a public bank, the State Bank of North Dakota. And it operates on this model that we've been talking about. And it's operated successfully ever since. And it's a shining example of what a public bank can do. North Dakota uh, has never operated in a situation of debt and deficit since that time. <laughs> Say <laughs> and, that again. <laughs> Louder. And, and, even, and even during the 2008-2010 the recession, uh, they sailed right through that without any negative effects in their public administration of their finances because they have this really effective public bank system. North Dakota has about the same population as New Brunswick. Mm -hmm. It's a small state. It's, it's rather downscale. They've had this recent kind of oil and natural gas situation, but that really has nothing to do with the ability of this government to operate the public bank. They've done it all before, and it continues right straight, right, straight through. Uh, and so everybody that's studying this refers back to North Dakota. And because it was so, it was so effective in maintaining their financial stability during this, this almost collapse in the, in the U.S., many other states and movements within states and municipalities are now looking very seriously at establishing a public bank. Philadelphia is, is really deep into establishing a public bank for the, for the municipality. So it can be done at a number of different levels wherever there's enough of a, enough of a uh, base to actually support that kind of thing. So there's a lot of information about how this works actually on the ground and has been successful, which uh, I'm no expert on this, but I've, I've followed it for a long time, and my interest is in really encouraging people, encouraging the right people to study this in a way and, and look at it for New Brunswick to see if this would make sense for us to get ourselves out of debt hmm. and deficit the way we are now. We've used a lot of American examples. Are there any Canadian examples? I know we don't have the population base other than uh, the Bank of Canada, but are there any examples of other areas? 
that have mm-hmm. actually tried this. I don't, I don't know of any. Okay. Uh, again, uh, that would be something to look into because a lot of things have happened in the last four or five years. There may well be some municipalities that are looking at this. Hmm. Um, but other than the Bank of Canada, which is a really good example in the Canadian experience, uh, I'm not aware of any right now that are moving in this yeah. direction. Uh, it, you know, another if that just occurs to me, there's a lot of talk about some aspect of maritime union or cooperation. That might be another framework because New Brunswick is really small. But if, if New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and PEI would look at this uh, model, that would be, I hadn't really thought about that before, but that, mm-hmm. that, there'd be a lot of barriers to it, I suppose. Uh, it might be easier for each province themselves to actually do it, but the scale uh, yes. would be a consideration as to whether it would be feasible at a smaller scale or a larger scale. Yeah. Maritime bank. You yeah, know. yeah, something like like that. That that would make it more complex um, because the legislations and yeah, you have to coordinate an awful yeah. lot of interests. <laughs> yeah, but but the but, economy or the economy of scale of it um, uh, would be because it's roughly two million people. Yeah, roughly. Yeah. So that in might terms be of accumulating the investment that would be needed to establish the bank, yeah. all those all those th- th- things. Um, the other thing to point out about about a public bank is that because it's a single purpose institution it's it's really not that complex in its administration and structure and so the the expense and the amount of money that would need to be uh, made available through the lending and for the operation for the just the overhead uh, would not be would not be nearly as great as it is for highly complex financial institutions that have all kinds of things going going on its mandate would be to serve the government's financial needs. Mm-hmm. It would be it would be fairly simple and straightforward in that way. The other thing, however, in North Dakota is a good example of this, is that they saw the opportunity, once the government had its own finances really well managed, they saw the opportunity to partner with with private banks in North Dakota to help businesses, farmers and small businesses. Uh, develop and get established. So the government themselves, or the the public bank itself, was not the the lending agent to these businesses, but they made it possible through cooperation with private banks to help small businesses. So there's a huge economic development potential once the government gets a public bank established to be of assistance in that in that way. That's that's such a key point because New Brunswick, based on its scale needs to find a new operational model for its economics. And yeah. so you just mapped out how banking fits in as a complementary support system or service for private banking, which then impacts small business or farmers um, trying to get started. Mm-hmm. And there's, uh, in some of the worlds I move through, there's a lot of conversation these days about trying to grow our own food, mm-hmm. trying to become more <coughs> self-sufficient with right. our food. One of the first obstacles that gets involved or gets surfaced very early in the conversation is, you know, how do I secure the financing Mm -hmm. to go back, reclaim some of that land? How do we share the equipment so the upfront costs aren't so heavy for one farm compared to four farms sharing equipment? Mm -hmm. All scale. Mm -hmm. It's all at the front end of playing with what's possible, but at least it's moving towards a solution Mm -hmm. and being proactive and, and almost that entrepreneur mindset into current day but into a different field because mm-hmm. when we think entrepreneur we tend to think the IT thing and yeah and, yeah but it's actually always been this way there's always people breaking new turf creating new models and creating new things but the banking part <laughs> it almost came to a full stop because they couldn't get the financing yeah so this bank of new brunswick concept would open that up it could. It could. Uh, it might take a little bit of time before it was established in a way that it could then begin to work to to assist that kind of process. But the other models, the the, the uh, North Dakota model and other places, uh, Vermont right now, there's a strong movement in Vermont to establish a, a, a public bank. And one of the key things that they're working on is to, is to structure that concept in a way that that would also have this economic development effect for small small entrepreneurs and farmers uh, to uh, to grow grow the, grow the economic base in, in a way and and then I mean obviously 
if that's successful, there's more economic growth. That means more tax revenue for the government, too. So the whole thing works together in a positive way. Well, um, that's one of those cliches when, when some of the standard way of looking at things in a typical way is, you know, all the, all water raises all boats or rising tide raises all boats. Rising tide it, raises all boats. Yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah. You saw these little fun phrases that don't describe the situation because the water isn't rising for everybody. No. We have more inequity today than we had 40, yeah. 50 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously there's something wrong with the model. Some of the boats are crashed on the <laughs> rocks. <laughs> yeah, and, and yet those, those people who say that don't acknowledge that. It, the way I really got into studying this uh, goes, goes back to the, to the 70s, really. Uh, well, it goes back farther than that because I was teaching in, in, in economic development work for a while. But um, in, in uh, the late, late 70s or early 80s, I was asked to participate in a conference uh, that was, that was uh, being hosted by the Mennonite Church in the United States. And it was a time when a lot of farm families were losing their farms. Ruinous interest rates on credit. Hmm. Uh, uh, downward pressure on farm product prices and, and rapidly increasing prices on farm equipment and farm inputs generally. The squeeze was on, so very successful, very well-managed farms all over the Midwest and the U.S. and some, not, not as much in Canada, but in the U.S. in particular. Uh, were going bankrupt. They were they were you know, looking at their situation and saying, you know, we simply can't continue. So they sold out to multinationals. They sold out to financial institutions who took over the land. Yeah. Uh, and these family farms, uh, who had been very successful, uh, were were losing their their farms. So this was a great concern to the Mennonite Church with a lot of these farmers in that area. <clears throat> so so I was at this conference and and. Um, all these stories were being told because the point of the conference was really to bring together people to support each other in this crisis. And it was, it was, a, it was an emotional crisis, it was a spiritual crisis for these, for these families. And so we, we heard all these stories and, and everything was described, how they had to make these transitions, but nothing was being said about why this was happening. So I, I got to thinking about it and I actually spoke to it and I said, look, it, it seems to me there's another way to think about this. You're talking about the farms are failing. But you're talking about farms that are perfectly intact, the soil is good, the rain still falls, the sun still shines, all the things that it takes to make a successful farm are there, and you're good farmers. What's failing? It's the, it's the monetary system that's failing to support good farming. The monetary system and all the associated pressures of globalization in that system are forcing these small to medium-sized farmers out the land will go on, but the land will now be in the hands of the major multinational corporations, financial industries. They're carrying on with the land. The small farmers are gone. Uh, unfortunate, uh, but but necessary winnowing time. They say, you know, well, I, you know, that didn't make that didn't make good sense to me. And I was feeling some of the same pressures here in New Brunswick, although my situation was very very different. Uh, we actually diversified our income with our farm at at that, that time because. I didn't want to get bigger. I wanted to stay the scale, the scale that we were actually operating, a uh, market, market garden size scale. Yeah. Uh, so, but that got me studying this whole situation and, and looking into why, why the monetary system is, is not able to support good farming. Uh, and so that's one of the questions that you raise. How could that be turned around? So the monetary system, the financial management of the funds that are available and can be cre created can help to support good farming, good small business development rather than this constant struggle. Why is money a scarce resource? Money, money is not a scarce resource. It can be created uh, you know, as it's needed. And that's one of, the, one of the features of design that needs to be un understood. Money, why should the government be borrowing money from the private financial institutions when it has the ability, it, it, it has, the, has the responsibility, according to Mackenzie King and many others, to actually provide a, a system of, of, of uh, common good financial management that helps to benefit everybody rather than just accumulate wealth at the, at the, at the top. But, and, and there's a lot of things there, but that's, <laughs> no, that's, great. That, that's what needs to be looked into very carefully, studied out, and a plan made that goes in the direction of a public bank so these benefits can be uh, 
realized. <laughs> so we're ha having a, an interesting travel through the history of banking and some different models. Um, what is it that we're not touching on that you know you, we need to touch on? Um, well, one of the things that I like to I like to use in talking about this um, is is the idea uh, is to try to understand what money really is, and this this backs up you know to to an understanding that generally doesn't come into play in these con conversations. Um, if you ask an economist uh, what money is, they will usually tell you, or they'll describe what money does. They'll, you know, it's a, <laughs> it's it's a means of exchange, it's a store of value, and it's a unit of account. Money has basically three different functions. That's yeah. pretty standard in terms of un understanding the financial system. But they say, well, that's not what money is. That's what money does. So let's back up a little bit and say, what what is money? What you know, what is money? Well. I've developed this idea, or this concept, and people have responded to it really well, that money is a technology of social trust. It, it works because everybody trusts that it works. It's no longer commodity-based. There's no longer gold back in your money. It's created by, by, by uh, yeah. notations on a computer screen. It's a social contract. Uh, yeah, very little of the money supply is actually in circulation. The, the coins and the bills is just a small fraction of the total money supply. Most of it is, is recorded on computer screens now. It used to be recorded in ledgers, uh, banking ledgers. Well, isn't it amazing that we all trust that system? It's, it's really quite incredible. It's, it's a beautiful system, <laughs> the, way, the way it works. When it fails, it's a disaster. And that's what happened in 2008, 2009, particularly in the United States, when the banks stopped trusting each other because they knew there was so much debt out there that was going to go bad. And so the people that have, have been involved in this, the, the people at the center of that situation, just at the time when the Bush administration transferred to the Obama administration, they talked about looking into the abyss. They could see the potential for the whole U.S. financial system to collapse. So what did they do? The government said, okay, you guys, you, you, this banking industry, these major banks, some of them did collapse. They, mm -hmm. they let, let them go, but they knew they couldn't let them all go. And so they said, we will provide, the government will provide what they call quantitative easing. We will put into your system enough money so you can start trusting each other again. They created that money. That money wasn't on deposits of somewhere. Yeah. The government under its own authority, constitutional authority, was able to create that money, put it into the system, and the banks could start operating again and slowly come out of this crisis once they almost failed. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of, of how the, the, um, the situation of money is based on this element of social, social trust, the, the whole framework of it. And that's really important to understand because that means it's a management problem. It's, it's a problem that has to be understood and manage very carefully as a society develops. And, and uh, most people think that money is a, like a defined quantity and there's only so much of it. And when you run out of it, you run out of it. Yeah, they think it's a thing. They think, it, think it's a thing. It's and so a, it's, an it's, object. it's like a, it's like a, a uh, it's like if you're building a house and, and the carpenters come to work in the morning and the boss says, well, sorry, guys, we can't work today because we've run out of inches. <laughs> what do you mean we've run out of inches? We've got, <laughs> we got saws, we've got hammer, we've got lumber, we've got everything we need to keep working. He said, no, no, you don't understand the financial system. We've run out of inches. Yeah. Money's the same way. It's a, it's a measurement that we all agree on, and it needs to be managed in a way that the trust is maintained, that, that it will be available and it will <clears> move <throat> in the way that benefits the whole, whole society. It's nice to the turn to trust, because that gets to an emotion. Yeah. And between people. So at the heart of our economic system is an emotion. It, 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 really, it really is. It's, it's, um, money is a curious thing. Unlike almost all other human inventions, it has, a, it has a very high emotional content that we don't quite understand. But I think the, the, reason, the reason that is, is because, at least in our situation now, in the modern world, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's absolutely essential for access to the means of life. So you think about access to the means of life, everything that we need 
to live a reasonable, secure, dignified way of life depends on having access to an adequate amount of money. Mm-hmm. Uh, it didn't used to be that way, but it's that way now. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Some yeah. people try to try to get out of that, but that's really where we where we are. So if that's the, that's the case, then that's then that's a common good. Money is a common good that needs to be needs to be designed and managed and used in a way that benefits everybody, so they have access have adequate access to the means of life. Doesn't mean everybody will have the same access. But there should at least be access so people aren't living in poverty, mm-hmm. uh, so businesses can be developed, a whole range of things. But, <coughs> but um, that, that fact that we all realize that money is absolutely critical for access to the means of life is why it's such an emotional issue. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's, that, it's that trust, uh, uh, trust element that I think is really important for people to understand. We're all engaged in this network of social trust. Uh, that that we want to keep going and we want to see it managed in a way that benefits everybody, not just the people that have control of it yeah. and are reaping huge profits off its administration. Which ties to another theme, and I don't want to pull you off your <laughs> off your track too much. Um, but the, it's firing in a lot of directions because of the topic. It's like talking about food or water or yeah, air. You know, it goes a lot of ways. It, yeah. uh, Kirchhoff wrote a book called Present Shock. And in that, it came out four or five years ago. And in that mm. book, there's a two-page, three-page section where he maps out money. Mm. And like you, he went back to King of England. Okay. Um, that's his starting point. But he also got into um, money as energy. So oh. if you saw, of it, saw it like electricity or, or just a, a, an exchange, an energy exchange mm-hmm. between people. And then he was mapping out, because um, he was talking about present shock, how everything has to happen now how we've lost our relationship with time or our relationship with time has shifted a bit. Mm-hmm. Part of that is the money aspect to it because it, it's so quick, electronic mm-hmm. transfers and such. Yeah, yeah, um, for sure. But it was about it needs to flow. It needs not, to flow. And when That's, money became yeah. an object and it became stored away in a vault somewhere yeah. or it became put offshore in trillion-dollar accounts, yeah. um, or when you can have a report from 2012 where some economists went then measured all of the trade balances or imbalances between all the countries. The headline in the news story was, we must be trading with Mars. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we're 300 trillion more than, yeah. you, know, you would think it would be a zero sum. Yeah. If you've got a finite universe and these countries are all trading with each other, then the balances and imbalances must come to zero. They must mm-hmm. cancel each other. Mm-hmm. And instead he found a $300 trillion surplus. Mm-hmm. So where is that where? coming from? You know, <laughs> yeah. But that points to flow. That money's supposed to flow. So anytime you read a news story where money's being hoarded, yeah. or stuck in billion-dollar accounts, then there's an emotional problem there yeah. that gets to the trust because money is supposed to flow. Well, and and it makes it seem like it's a personal possession. And we we all we all need money. We all need a certain amount available to us. We need a certain reserve, but it's not really a personal possession. It's we're in a system in which money is flowing, and we need to be in the flow so we can live a decent life. That's that's the, that's the point. Uh, it's nice. It's nice to have a certain amount secured, mm-hmm. but that's really based on the on the network of trust that we're all involved in. The analogy with energy is really interesting because. It, it brings up the same thing. People think about electricity as a commodity, but it's not really a commodity. It, it's just this flow, and it, it has to be present all the time at all the points where it's being used. It's not something that flows, you know, in a literal <laughs> sense from Matraquac Dam to your, to your stove or your light bulb. It's something that's right there at your house all the time. The system is managed in a, in a really amazing way as best they can, yeah. <laughs> except when the storm comes and the, and the lines go, go down. So, so that electricity is available to you when you need it. Uh, and and uh, that, that's a really good, uh, really good analogy. So, could we take another turn and bring this sure. back to New Brunswick? Because sure. this is yeah. fr- framed up stuff. It, yeah. And, and one, I did a little bit of homework, so I'll hold this up. So a friend actually gave me this example of a, mm-hmm. a dollar bill from a bank in New Brunswick in another time. And if you go on Wikipedia online, you'll find that there was a history of a bank in New Brunswick mm-hmm. in this province once upon a time. I don't know if its structure was the same as the structure you're mapping out, but it had that same name. And it was on, um, on a street in St. John. I forget uh, which street it was on. But there's pictures of what the bank physical building looked like and that sense of autonomy that came yeah. with it. And yeah. 
in the boom days when New Brunswick was a booming place and St. John was actually bigger than Toronto or uh, a few other places. That's when a lot of uh, small banks uh, issued their own, own currency and it was trusted within the context of that bank's uh, op operation to function just the way the money, the federal money we have now is entrusted to function. It's interesting, I didn't know about that when I gave my lecture at St. Thomas a few w weeks ago and uh, someone brought that up and and uh, I haven't yet looked looked into it so I don't know what the history of the Bank of New Brunswick is but I suspect it was it was probably a private bank uh, that was chartered you know to operate within a certain certain area but uh, it, it's interesting that yeah, there's there, a history of that. To support that I'll yeah. just read the first sentence. So the Bank of New Brunswick was established on March 25, 1820 mm -hmm. in the pre-confederation province of New Brunswick, Canada <clears throat> as the first Canadian bank to operate under a charter. Oh, okay. Following the Great Fire in St. John, its headquarters were established in a new building on Prince William Street in 1879. Um, and then it was uh, bought up by a larger bank. And at this time, St. John was the largest city in the Maritime Provinces, exceeding the population of both Halifax and Toronto. That's interesting, yeah. And so it was a real so, center so, of development, and a, uh, a bank was established to serve that That. Uh, so I didn't want to... Yeah, I didn't want to lose that because it's not new. <laughs> we've, we've done this once before. Maybe the days are new, the times are new. Right. Uh, technology is new. And that was before there was a federal system of currency, yeah. uh, a, national, a national monetary system. So each, each region, each area that needed to have a circulating concurrency, uh, these types of local banks were developed. And actually that was the big argument between Jefferson and Hamilton Jefferson thought it would be much better to have a lot of small decentralized banks serving the populations. Of course, it was a rural; it was mostly rural in, in those days. Hamilton wanted it centralized out of New York, and that's what happened. Mm. And we're still living in that framework yeah, yeah. now. Yeah. So, so to bring it back home <clears throat> yeah. a bit, mm -hmm. and we've got about um, 15 or so minutes to go. What does New Brunswick need to do? Or back to your lecture. Um, what is the next step in this process so we can <coughs> apply right. some, right. Uh, give the audience some leads or give the audience some things to go think about now, like how do we get on with doing this? Well, what I, what I recommend, because in, you know, when you talk about this, you can only sort of cover the, the surface and some of the ideas, but there's a lot of information that's available to study out uh, how it could be developed and how it could um, apply. So I have references that uh, would make that possible. But what I think uh, should should really happen is that um, there needs to be an education process and there, there needs to be a dissemination of information about a public bank uh, concept being a reasonable one to first of all at least study out <laughs> and see how it might apply to New Brunswick's situation in order for us to get out of the debt and deficit problem that we're in. It wouldn't happen immediately. It would take a fairly long period of time because we have all these obligations now which have to be managed and paid off. But if a public bank were established, then at least you would no longer have a further accumulation of debt. The That group would have to be pay, paid off over a period of time. So it would be a number of years probably before the government had its management totally within its own jurisdiction. Um, so to, to get this underway, it seems to me that one of two, two things, there has to be enough citizens who are really eager to, to pursue this and understand it and build an education program around it to create, to create a, uh, a political movement or a, or, a, or a social movement for introducing this to the, to, to, to the government or uh, people in the government need to understand that this is a reasonable possibility for a solution to a really severe and ongoing problem and strike a commission. Uh, let's study this. Let's really look at this carefully uh, and see if it would actually work for us. So those two, those two steps, wide, widespread public education uh, on, the, on the concept of a public bank and its application to New Brunswick, or and maybe at the same time, um, if there could be if a bipartisan un understanding that this would be something the government ought to seriously look at to to study it in a serious way, so those are the steps that I would I would recommend. And there's plenty of information. 
Um, I've, I've been developing some of this in terms of uh, sharing it, and I'm very happy to continue to do, do that. But anybody can go online and find, find this stuff, too. I just happen to organize my own thoughts in a certain way. <clears throat> Why are you doing all this? <laughs> uh, well, uh, partly because, referring back to that experience I had going to this conference and hearing these really unfortunate stories about farm loss and thinking about it in my own situation, um, and and having been committed uh, for a long time to, to uh, local uh, economic development issues. I mean, I, I was teaching for a period of time in the college in terms of economic development, small scale economic development, community development, uh, and sort of all the aspects of social ecology that go into building up secure, prosperous communities. And you can see that at a sort of a small scale or a regional scale and even, you know, a larger scale. But that, that commitment to, to um, the ethics, really, the, the ethics of what I consider to be the kind of relationships that should obtain between people in community, between businesses, and, and uh, the population that they are part of and that they serve, that they should be, that they should be more equitable, that there's a, there's a real uh, important ethical principle about the wealth of a country being shared in a reasonable way. Not everybody has the same. There's going to be people that have more than others, and that's, that's the way it goes. But there should be a greater sharing of the wealth that a country has available to it as, as it develops, or a region. So, so, for example, when we started farming back in the early 70s in the Woodstock area, one of the first things we did was to get together with a bunch of other small pr producers and establish a farm market. And that farm market, it, it, it's a, it's a co-op. It runs to this day. It's now a six-day-a-week op operation. Uh, <coughs> and so that, that commitment to small-scale economic development, which supports people and, and helps to create good livelihoods is something that I've just always worked at. <laughs> you raise an interesting point about cooperation amongst people. Mm -hmm. Niels Riemann, when he was here talking about medical cannabis, mm -hmm. was talking about the need for a cooperative culture amongst all of the businesses starting to emerge around medical cannabis, oh, okay. rather than a competitive culture uh -huh. where everybody's in secret and they're not sharing what they're doing and they need the, he needed the government to be more open and transparent mm -hmm. with how all of this was being uh, unfolded and evolving right now. So you've just mapped out, the, well, this is how you do it. You, you're sort of in competition with each other, but you're really not. You're responsible for creating a whole culture and a community. Yeah. And so yeah. it's a fascinating thing. And again, it's an, an emotional and it's a values-driven thing. Yeah. That, that competitive model doesn't work <laughs> in some places. It can create innovation, it can create certain pressures, but at some point it th crosses a threshold and it has to get into a cooperative approach to some degree for the culture within that particular sector. Yeah, if, if you think about the economy generally and, and the emphasis that's put on competition to make the economy work, to grow the economy, hmm. um, but actually uh, the basis of the economy is cooperation. Uh, it's It's sort of like... It's sort of like uh, like an internal combustion engine, which will be fading away shortly, <laughs> I suppose. But yeah. but you 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 have this complex organization which works really well. Competition is like is like a spark plug that that helps things to go. But if you didn't have that basic cooperative mechanism operating underneath that competition, you would just get competition. Uh, it would it would get worse and worse, and and uh, you wouldn't be able to sustain the 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 common good element of your economy that really is essential. You'd have, well, and that it's, it's happened in the last couple of decades. We've had this, this increase in inequity because of the emphasis on competition. Winners and losers. Yes. Uh, that's, that's the model. Um, well, it works for some people. It doesn't yeah. work for everybody. And if you're committed to democracy, if you're committed to equity, if you're committed to living yeah. a secure life in a good society, uh, there, there's a real... There's a really uh, 
important baseline of cooperation and working together. A farm market is a perfect ex example on a very small small scale. All the producers come in there. Uh, four or five people have tomatoes at any one one time, and well. Some people want to put their prices down so they'll make sure they sell it out, and other people want to keep the prices up. So you kind of you kind of have an understanding that nobody nobody drastically undercuts some somebody. You kind of set your price according to what the market should really be, yeah. uh, and you work together that that way. Um, and we've we've gone through that in the Woodstock market really in an interesting way because we're a small community. Uh, producers all know each other. And occasionally you get a problem. In case you occasionally get to somebody who, who kind of won't cooperate in the spirit that makes the market successful, but you work it out. It's a it's a social it's a social context. The notion of team, you know, everybody has a role to play. Yeah. And if there's one basketball or one ball, one puck, and and if everybody goes, well, it's my puck, I'm going to keep it. <laughs> yeah. It, it, your team's going nowhere. Yeah. So yes, you can be in a competitive structure. But without the spirit of cooperation or yeah. a sense of balance yeah. and a sense of speaking to the greater good, because mm -hmm. you're all in it together. There's only one puck. There's only one ball. There's yeah. only yeah. one market. Mm -hmm. There's only one New Brunswick. And until we get through a certain emotional shift that you can't be in it to win just for you, your winning is connected to everybody else having a certain sense of benefit from that as well. Right. You want the whole, the whole community, the whole region or province to actually benefit together. Yeah. yeah. So, so maybe another key to all of this is a, a greater understanding of a spirit of cooperation amongst competitors. Um, Fredericton has a nice little example of cooking right now, and the community's benefited from it to a large degree in the craft brewing industry. Mm -hmm. Right. Because mm -hmm. all of those players share. They share notes. They talk. They compete with each other. They'll giggle about it. Yeah. You know. Yeah, that's but, interesting. But yeah, they also yeah. recognize. Yeah, yeah, and we help each other out, and we can create a buzz. They're sharing the market in our community. But as they, sh but that market enlarges as they cooperate with each other. Yeah. That's that's the thing. Yeah. yeah. So can we yeah. do that with banking? Can we do that with farming? Can we do that with some of the IT work that's going on? Mm -hmm. So it becomes an emotional shift, not a shift in details. Well, in 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 terms in terms of the. Um, banking, the credit union movement is a really good example of that, and that's why I come back to the idea of a public bank is like a credit union for the government, uh, a financial institution which can manage the the finances that the government is is bringing in and sending out within a within a context that benefits the citizens in you know over, overall right now so much money is being siphoned off in interest payments every every year uh, th that there's a huge loss and the idea of a public bank is to stop that loss so more of that money can stay in the province and benefit everybody as the government provides the services it needs to pr provide and the and the impetus for in a, additional economic n development any final thoughts uh, there's many things I think about that I haven't said, <laughs> but uh, no, I, I think you've done really well in, in in taking us through a whole range of things. We've covered a lot, uh, and there's so much more to dig into, and that's what I would really emphasize, that, that anybody interested in these ideas uh, should really begin to study them out, because the more people that understand this, the more conversations we can have. Um, I, can, I can say that... Uh, this information is is being shared with the Green Party as a starting point, uh, and it may or may not come up in political conversations as we go go ahead. But I would personally, uh, uh, just on my own, am looking to find ways to share this information. So I really appreciate this opportunity. Great. Thanks for coming. Okay. It was a great conversation. <laughs> and thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon.